And the cops, look, the cops feel justified because they've manufactured reasons to uphold that order, right? They've created their own boogeymen out of these nonviolent protesters. And to them, these chants and songs and signs all have rhythm. And as Gloria Estefan said, the rhythm is going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get you. Welcome to a brand new episode of Forkful of Noodles. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Hey, what you're about to see was recorded in front of a live virtual audience. Uh, I've been doing virtual live stand-up comedy shows, uh, and, uh, and some uh, people, uh, people enjoy it, it seems. Uh, so you'll hear them laughing in the background. That's pretty exciting. Uh, so if you would like to be a part of the live virtual audience, you can do so by purchasing tickets to links are in the description below. These shows happen every Friday night, virtually every Friday night all through the summer and into the fall since we're living in the age of the quarantine. Uh, and, uh, and touring is not particularly a thing that's happening right now. So these virtual stand-up comedy shows is, is how I'm making a living, how I'm putting out these, uh, these, these videos here. Uh, so check out the links, see if you can attend a show. Each week, it's different material, it's a different theme, it's a different show, uh, and each week, we also donate half of the ticket sales to a different grassroots organization, venue, uh, uh, activists or journalists uh, uh, that, uh, that, that are more grassroots and more about the people, um, and, and that, are, that are just as radical as the topics we discuss in this show. So uh, come hang out, come grab those tickets. This week, the, the, the episode that you're watching, we donated half of the ticket sales to Level Up Studios in my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They are a creative playground. They're a community-oriented creative playground. They're a POC-run uh, venue, uh, dance studio, recording studio, and they're all about the community. So we wanted to make sure that uh, that that we were we were able to to help them out in their endeavors, as they've helped helped me out a couple times uh, in my endeavors as well. I've known them for a long time. They're a great group of folks. So if you want to make additional donations to them, if you weren't able to make it to the show and you want to make some additional donations, go to leveluppgh.com. The link is in the description below. Now, if you want free tickets to come to these shows, because you can totally get free tickets to come to these shows, you can become a sustaining member over at krishmohan.com. By becoming a sustaining member, either directly on the website, on Patreon, or on Bandcamp, you get exclusive unreleased bonus stand-up comedy material. You get early access to the longer, bigger chunks of Fork Full of Noodles that end up getting broken up into these episodes. You get the full episodes as, as early access. Um, you get uh, you get special little little merch stuff. You get bonus video content. Uh, you get a bunch of crazy shit by becoming a sustaining member. So go to krishmohan.com, check it out there, and, uh, and and think of becoming a sustaining member. It helps out the show. It helps out a good cause as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, once again, krishmohan.com. All right, now on to this week's episode. Right. Uh, so look, it's hard to ignore a revolution when it's literally at your doorsteps every single day and sometimes also burns down your Wendy's and Targets. It's very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Fire is really hard to burn down. Uh, ignore it, you guys. It's very Burns, difficult. Right. It really, should we be mad that a Wendy's was burned down? Is that, is that really what we should be mad about? I mean, we should have done that a long time ago when we found out. <laughs> yeah, we, we should have done that when we found out Wendy, not a real redhead, you guys. <laughs> it's a fucking, yeah. fucking long sucking <laughs> die job right there, is what that is. That never frozen thing, never really trusted. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> you set that bitch on fire a long time ago. <laughs> I Not the person, just... the building, the building of Wendy's. I understand what I said came up kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is a massive movement that we're seeing in our society. 
Uh, and it stems from another black man that was murdered by the police. And right now there are calls to defund the police, which has become a very controversial statement, right? Some folks fear the notion of defunding the police and radically changing the criminal justice and law enforcement systems. So they bring up the idea of reform. Now, recently, uh, master reformer Joe Biden uh, spoke at a church and gave his ideas on what he thinks reform should be. And this is, uh, I want to remind everybody, at a church. This is what he said. Because we also have to fundamentally change the way in which police are trained. Police are trained much more. Now, and by the way, there are a lot of people overwhelmingly it's African-Americans who've been victimized, shot, and there's a lot of other people who were shot and killed in the Hispanic community and the white community. And the idea that instead of standing there and teaching a cop when there's an unarmed person coming at him with a knife or something, shooting him in the leg instead of in the heart is a very different thing. You guys, you guys remember when Jesus was like, I sweep the leg. <laughs> 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 You got to then you got to deliver justice, right? You guys remember when Jesus said that? It's a very um, wasn't that wasn't... was a that was a pretty bad like bad <laughs> statement by Joe Biden. It like was... <laughs> anyone in the heat of the moment, like I think it's fairly well known that cops don't usually practice shooting, and they're terrible at shooting. Of course, <laughs> yeah. they're not going to be able to aim okay, for the leg. I'm going to aim for the leg. Yeah. Like, yeah. So basically his idea of reform is to maim citizens and then leave them <laughs> defenseless to police violence <laughs> or to get them into a hospital and, you know, uh, leave them in medical debt. That's another thing. Yeah, that not he wants support to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's our reform right there. I feel like uh, Joe Biden is uh, is the type of fisherman that doesn't practice catch and release. Right. But what he rather what he does is he catches the fish but then he throws it back in the water with the hook attached and then he drags it around the lake for a few hours, you know? <laughs> but before that, he sniffs, he sniffs the fish. He sniffs the fish a little bit. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's called, that's called reformed fishing, you guys, is what that's called. <laughs> oh, man. And, and that'll teach, that'll punish that fish for the crime of, you know, like being a fish. Swimming. Take that fish. <laughs> Look, and it's not just Biden, right? The entire establishment is guilty of making these fake reforms. The Republicans, they just stay silent on everything or just have awful viewpoints. Like maybe that person just shouldn't be black, which is like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Like the Republicans are uh, on a daily basis are proof that science is important and evolution isn't for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> like some people are still neanderthals you know yeah. and it turns out like they didn't really go extinct they just started running for office <laughs> that's what happened the democrats came out with their police reform bill and it went as far as far as to say you know uh, chokeholds should be banned yeah no fucking shit, Democrats. <laughs> like, why, why were they part of the training to begin with? You know, that's like coffee shops having a rule that says, hey, baristas, uh, don't dunk your genitals into the customer's drink. <laughs> <laughs> Bad idea. <laughs> and besides, the NYPD did ban chokeholds, and Daniel Pantaleo yeah, yeah. is still free after choking Eric Gardner to death over fucking nothing. Look, banning chokeholds is just common sense, right? You shouldn't get a Nobel Peace Prize for exhibiting basic kindergarten rules. These are breadcrumbs, not reforms. That's I'm I'm more curious as into like what enforcement is gonna be for because I mean just just like what you said, because slavery there was a because uh, slavery was abolished, but then like it took still took two years for some people to get it. So <laughs> yeah. If we put in yeah. these reforms. Not everyone's going to get it immediately, take. so what are you going to do to enforce these things? That's part of the problem, is they, do, they don't do that. Uh, and, and, yeah, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I, we will get to that. I sh should mention, if you have questions, uh, we'll do a Q&A at the end. I forgot to okay. mention that part. Uh, but that was on me. That's on you guys. Uh, 
but but it is and, and look uh to understand why reform is not an option right sean brought up a very important question is what are we going to do to enforce these laws danny pantalea is still free and in order to understand why reform is not a viable option you have to look at the history of police itself right the history of police shows us that policing is a system specifically designed for violence to keep the working class in their place and to protect the basically protect rich people's stuff that's that's really what uh policing was built to do so back in 1704 the Carolina colony started using deputized vigilantes as slave patrols to ensure that runaway slaves wouldn't get very far. Uh, and this was basically done to maintain economic order and assist wealthy landowners. And these, and these deputized vigilantes were paid and in charge of recovering and punishing slaves. And they felt justified because slaves were looked at as property, not people. Okay, this would basically be like if, uh, if Bruce Wayne decided to hire some unemployed factory workers in Gotham City, dressed them up as Batman, and then sent them out to beat the shit out of other poor people, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and he did this because, you know, he was sad and had to protect his wealth because that's the only way he feels love. That's why he had to do it. <laughs> Now, by, by, by the 1780s, Charleston, South Carolina, had paramilitary forces to control slaves. And at this point, the country was approaching industrialization, and there was a general consensus that slavery was a concerning practice. And, I mean, nobody, like, stopped using slaves for another hundred years, but a lot of people were like, boy, this doesn't feel right, but, you know, the economy, so... <laughs> Does that kind yeah. of sound familiar to today? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's, it's wild. So let's fast forward to today, right? Let's fast forward to the 20th century. We see cops doing what? We see cops protecting pipelines, corporations, and protecting gaudy mascots of a criminal economic system. They're literally doing exactly what their job was originated to be, right? When they say protect and serve, they mean protect the economy and serve the wealthy. Their job is more about protecting inanimate objects and fish, fictional things than it is serving the community because that's their fucking heritage. That's where they come from. And don't worry, you guys, don't worry. Uh, the Yankees were doing it too. They weren't innocent in all this. In New England, there were uh, Indian constables uh, that policed Native Americans. And more importantly, in the North, um, they, were, uh, they were using privatized police to break up strikes, which the establishment and economic elites were calling rioting. Now they were described as centralized body of men legally authorized to use force to maintain order. It also provided the illusion that this order was being maintained under the rule of law, not the whim at economic power. So what we're talking about here is the Pinkertons. Right? And these guys were often hired in the 17 and 1800s to attack strikers and use force to maintain order. And the Pinkertons, the, the guys that they sent out to do this, were just poor, out-of-work men that were either trying to feed their family or get an education. This is pretty much how the military-industrial complex operates today. Right? And these guys were used to break strikes in, in Chicago, in Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and all throughout the country they were, they were used. And their conflicts almost always ended violently. Now fast forward to the 20th century, and you see the American police using chemical weapons that were banned by the Geneva Conventions to maintain order. Look, tear gas is so awful that the American military won't even use it. Do, do you guys understand the level of psychopathy you have to achieve to use a weapon the American military won't use? <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Guys, yes. they drone bombed a wedding and then they blamed the bride and groom for it. <laughs> and the cops, look, the cops feel justified because they've manufactured reasons to uphold that order, right? They've created their own boogeymen out of these nonviolent protesters. And to them, these chants and songs and signs all have rhythm 
And as Gloria Estefan said, the rhythm is going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get you. So. She knew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she knew. She nailed it. <laughs> and look, it has, it's not like we haven't tried real reform, right? And I'm not talking about like going for the legs like Jesus would, obviously. Uh, <laughs> In 1968, uh, police chief Victor Sizankas tried to change the way people looked at the Menlo Park Police Department in California. Uh, he practiced some alternative ways of making the police look less aggressive. And so not only was he hiring folks from like more empathetic practices, he also removed the hardened look of the cops by changing their uniform, right? The Menlo Park police had clashed with these protesters, sometimes violently. And after years and years of this, the department had a pretty rough reputation. Had a reputation for being a very tough police department, a very aggressive police department, and somewhat of a very uh, anti-race kind of a police department. That's Dominic Peloso. He was hired in 1970 by Chief Sizenkis, the guy... Chief Sizenkis had hired Dominic right out of the Jesuit seminary, where Dominic had been studying to be a priest. Sizenkis liked hiring officers from non-traditional law enforcement backgrounds and with higher levels of education. It was just one of his strategies for reforming the department. He also let his officers grow their hair out and have beards and mustaches. He changed all the pseudo-military titles to more corporate ones. Sergeants became managers, for example, and lieutenants became directors. Now we know where the cop stash comes from, you guys. 1968, Chief Sizankas. <laughs> <laughs> now, Chief Sizankas uh, decided to go with, as you guys can see here, with, uh, with a green blazer with a patch instead of what we see today, which is basically uh, RoboCop on Casual Friday. <laughs> it's pretty much what cops look like now. And this, the whole idea behind this was uh, for this, to put the citizens at ease, right? When you see a cop in a blazer, you put, the, the citizens were supposed to be put at ease. But the, there was a little bit of a problem because the citizens didn't recognize these guys as cops. So the officers would start getting really, really upset about this. On the other side were the old school police officers who missed the traditional uniform and all that it represented. They enjoy the ego stuff that goes with it. Um, they also enjoy that sense of authority um, that you show, um, the clearness of who they are. With the blazer, it just wasn't always that clear. You know, I'd stop a person, let's say for a violation, and I'd walk up and say, can I see your license, you know? And they'd look at me and say, well, let's see your license. You know, who are you? <laughs> then you'd point to the little patch and say, well, I'm the police, you know? This is retired Sergeant Van Trask. He worked under Sazankas, and generally he liked the chief's style and approach. But he admits that it caused some complications. Their complaint was basically, hey, we look like nerds. And it's, it's, it's a long known fact that cops have to destroy nerds. Okay, you can't just be looking like fucking nerds. Look, this is called a transition. Right? It's kind of like puberty, you know? You don't, you don't go from adolescent to a fully functioning adult. We have to go through this awkward transition, which includes some random boners, you know, random boob growth, pimples, strange smells, <laughs> an array of vocal ranges. <laughs> and, and just, and so, and so many fucking hormones, you guys. So many <laughs> hormones. And it can be said, that some people get stuck there and never really grow out of this phase, right? You know, the people that kind of like peak in high school and then become police officers because they think it's cool. You know those guys? <laughs> now, Sazankas, his reformation of the cops was so wildly unpopular that 75% of the Menlo Police Department quit. And soon after that, he was transferred to Stanford, Connecticut. Many officers got so frustrated that they quit. The numbers we've heard on this vary. Van said about half the department left. Dominic thinks it was even higher. I would guess that in his first four years as police chief, we had about a 75% turnover. People just left and went to other departments. But I think they just couldn't take his, his overall thinking, his out-of-the-box thinking, his philosophy and stuff. So they all just, just abandoned. 
and eventually Sazankus left too, to take over as the chief of a police department in Stamford, Connecticut. You know, there's some talk that uh, he was actually uh, kind of encouraged um, to leave. And not long after he left, the department switched back to the traditional uniform style. Sazankus passed away in 1980. The Blazers didn't make the cops less violence, less violent, right? It, did, it didn't stop them from brutalizing citizens. It just made them appear as if they don't, you know, because they look like fucking nerds. And it kind of looks like they're going to sell you a timeshare. That's kind of what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> like if a Menlo Park police officer dressed in a blazer did brutalize a protester, people would be so confused, whether if it was like a cop or an HR rep that was taking their job too seriously, you know? (laughs) (laughs) So confusing. (laughs) Now, former presidential candidate Andrew Yang suggested that we change the name of the Minneapolis Police Department to the Minneapolis Guardians. So now, when a violent cop beats you, they can just claim that they're guarding you, like from yourself. You know, they're helping. They're doing a good job. Because they're also all the sounds like a sports team. It does. It sound sounds like, a... like they're part. <laughs> sounds like they're part of the XFL, which is probably <laughs> never coming back. <laughs> I think that's going to be the name of the, the what the what the Redskins are going to change their name to. The, Red... <laughs> yeah. the Washington Guardians. Yeah. Yeah, we got to make sure that they're all guarded. <laughs> Like that's that's not any less racist, guys. It's not less racist. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, man. I just don't want them to come up with just like the Washington Sky people. Fuck. God damn it. Stop it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not reforming anything. <laughs> Look, the reality is that reform can't happen from within because they'll get rid of the reformers, just like Chief Zizankas, right? And but revolutionary ideas are a lot harder to ignore. So we got to keep going with this revolution. It's important. But more than, more than that, you can't reform an idea or a system that still is as racist as its origins, right? The, the police system is still as racist as what it was during the slave patrols. As recent as 2017, police departments in cities like Sacramento and Portland, Oregon, have been using white supremacist and neo-Nazi groups to help quell anti-racist protests. And after the Trump inauguration, activists were put on trial for, quote unquote, inciting violence. Look at the difference between the treatment of the lockdown protesters that showed up with guns on Capitol steps versus the calls for respecting black lives. This is all proof that the slave patrol still lives on and has no intention of reforming its ways because it is and will continue to be the vigilantes hired by the rich to protect their stuff. That's been your fork full of noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, give it a like, give it that share, and make sure that you're subscribed to this channel to get more videos. I put out videos on a weekly basis. I put out new episodes of Fork Full of Noodles once a week, sometimes even twice a week if I'm feeling kind of crazy. These are the more scripted uh, history and philosophy based comedy shows that I do in front of a live virtual audience that you can be a part of by clicking that link in the ticket and getting your ticket today. They're only five bucks. They happen every single Friday uh, into the summer and into the fall. Um, Not just that, but I also release uh, a show called Road Reflections, which is a more looser, rantier show where I talk about the week's news. I I do a a segment called The Dispatch, which is uh, uh, more about current events. It's it's a little bit shorter, uh, current events, news topics. Uh, that is part of my podcast, Taboo Table Talk. And I'm also going to be releasing some interview clips on this channel as well uh, from my podcast, Taboo Table Talk. So there's going to be a bunch of crazy shit coming at you uh, that you don't want to miss. So make sure you are subscribed to this channel. If you want to become a sustaining member, if you want to grab tickets to a live virtual stand-up comedy event coming up in the near future, If you want to get a a stand-up comedy album of mine, if you want to check out past episodes of this show, subscribe to the podcast, 
uh, get emails from me, wh whatever you want. It's, there's, there's a one-stop shop to do it, and that's krishmohan.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N, krishmohan.com. That's a one-stop shop for all things Krish Mohan. You can become a sustaining member and get early access to Fork Full of Noodles. You can uh, get, get unreleased stand-up comedy material. You can get free tickets to live uh, vir virtual live stand-up comedy events. You can do a bunch of crazy shit on, on krishmohan.com. So uh, go check it out there. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Until next week. We'll